looked at, uh, they found that the upper lip bite test, you know, whether you're able to get your upper lip, uh, you know, bite your upper lip, uh, among all the tests uh, was more favorable, uh, you know, tests for accuracy. So the real message from this Cochrane review and another similar one that has come, uh, which was published in the JAMA in the surgery, will this patient be difficult to operate? And this was also look, uh, a systematic review looking at all the tests. And interestingly, they found that although several simple clinical findings are very useful for predicting high likelihood of a difficult tracheal intubation, no clinical finding reliably excludes a difficult airway. So again, here also they found that an abnormal upper lip bite test, and this is very easy to do at the bedside, raises probability of difficulty, right? Increases the probability from 10% to almost 60%. But again, it's not perfect. So the real message from these systematic reviews and meta-analysis is not that don't do pre-op airway assessment. You must do it because it gives you some objective, uh, you know, idea of the difficulty. For for example, if a patient cannot open the mouth, you know, you know that in this patient, if you, you know, you cannot put in a supraglottic airway device. So you gives you gives you some objective assessment. But the really important message is do not rely only on the airway test. Even if your difficult airway test do not predict a difficult airway, you can have an unanticipated difficult airway, and you should be prepared for any and all airway managers should be prepared to uh, you know manage an unanticipated difficult airway. And also that among the tests that are available, it is the upper lip bite test that has the most that is has the most sensitivity and specificity. So that is why many airway societies have guidelines. Now it's very important, you know, what are guidelines? Guidelines are not a law. This is a statement to determine a course of action. And the purpose of a guideline is to streamline particular processes according to a set of sound practice. So you're using evidence base to guide the clinicians. So following a guideline is never mandatory. Remember that. And guidelines are made uh, you know, to make the actions more predictable and presumably of higher quality. So if you have a guideline, you know that in this situation, this is what I should be doing. And it's an evidence-based document. But again, it is not the uh, law. Now, in 2015, you know that the Difficult Airway Society of UK came up with the uh, guidelines. And if you look at any of the guidelines that have come up, structurally, they're pretty much the same. I mean, at least the principles are pretty much the same, though structurally, there might be some variation. And here you can say, see in the DAS guidelines, you can see that they start with the tracheal intubation. And if you fail the tracheal intubation, if you succeed, of course, con uh, confirm tracheal tube position with capnography. If you fail, then you must use a second generation supraglottic airway device and maximum three attempts at intubation. If you fail supraglottic airway device, maximum three attempts. If you succeed, then either you can wake up the patient or try to intubate through a supraglottic airway device, or you proceed without intubating the trachea, or you can do a trachea. Now, if you fail, even supraglottic airway device can fail, then you do make one last attempt at good mask ventilation, paralyze the patient. And sometimes when you paralyze the patient, you are able to intubate the patient. In this situation, of course, you wake up the patient and postpone the uh, case. But if everything fails, then you have to do an emergency front. They call it phona or front of neck access. And they recommend only surgical technique for cricotherotomy. That is a surgical cricotherotomy. So essentially, the steps in most airway guidelines are three attempts at intubation. If you cannot do, don't go on and on intubating. Put in a supraglottic airway device. If supraglottic airway device three attempts fail, then try one last attempt at bag mass ventilation. And if that fails, then proceed very quickly to do neck rescue and doing a cricotherotomy. Remember, tracheostomy is not emergency airway management. We need to do the cricotherotomy because the cricotherotomy membrane is more superficial. It is most accessible in the emergency, least vascular, and that is quickly performed. And that's why we should do a cricotherotomy and not tracheostomy when all your three upper lifelines for airway management fail. And what are your three lifelines? One is the endotracheal tube, Second is a supraglottic airway device, and third is mask ventilation. So these are the three lifelines that you have. And when all the three lifelines fail, despite the best attempt, then you should immediately do the cricotherotomy and you should not uh, delay any further. So uh, I will also allude to the Indian guidelines that we have made, and this is a difficult airway guideline. This came in 2016, and we published several guidelines on difficult airway for obstetrics pediatrics, but the adult guidelines was one of them, and I was very, very proud to lead this. And for the first time, we had guidelines for airway management in 2016 uh, that were made for India. And I won't tell you, put you through the process, but I'll tell you very quickly about what the algorithm looked like. So if you see pretty similar principles, but I will just tell you what uh, are the subtle differences 
challenges that we have, most important in any unanticipated difficulty way, the most important thing that you should do is when you have encountered the first difficulty, you should call for help, right? Because the faster you call for help, the faster help is likely to achieve, uh, to come, and you will need help in certain settings. So call for help very early when you have the first difficulty. I will very quickly put you through the various steps of the uh, algorithm. So the first part is when you do the laryngoscopy and tracheal intubation. We encourage the use of nasal oxygenation during attempts at intubation. Maximum two more attempts after the first failed attempt. And very important, uh, when you fail an attempt, then you must try the next attempt. You should do something to increase the success. So don't do the same thing again and again and again. For example, change the position, give external laryngeal manipulation, release the cracker pressure, use a bougie and stillate. If you use a direct laryngoscope, use a video laryngoscope. So in every subsequent attempt, you should do something that will increase the success, not do the same thing again and again, right? And most important while doing all this manipulation, maintain the depth of anesthesia. Of course, if you succeed, very, very important, you need to confirm tracheal intubation using capnography. There should be at least five to six traces of consistent waveform capnography. Do not respond to one capnography trace. Sometimes what happens is when you have a very difficult intubation, difficult mass ventilation, a lot of air goes into the stomach. And when that happens, uh, when you put your tube and if it's in the esophagus, all that air will come out and it will give you a capnography taste, but subsequently there will be a decline. in the. So you should always wait for six to seven traces before confirming that the tube is in the uh, trachea when you look at capnography. So it's really, really important. Now, if after three attempts you fail, then you, of course, you must continue bag mass ventilation. One thing in the Indian guidelines, we have said that you repeat the attempts only if the saturation is more than 95, because it's very important to mask ventilation in between. And three attempts doesn't mean you do one, two, three, one after the other. Make sure that the saturation is maintained between attempts at uh, tracheal intubation. Now, if you fail tracheal intubation, then you move to the next step, and that is putting the supraglottic airway device inside, and preferably second generation supraglottic airway device. What do we mean by the second generation supraglottic airway device? These are the supraglottic airway devices like the ProSeal, Supreme, uh, Oragain, uh, then you know the other uh, second generation ones, and these have a gastric drainage port. Now, this is very important because they give you better protection against aspiration. You can uh, put a rails tube inside, you can aspirate the gastric contents, you can decompress the stomach, and uh, also they give you higher sealing pressure. So they give you better safety against the risk of aspiration. So if at all you put in a supraglottic airway device, don't put in a classic LMA, try to put a second generation LMA, and the DAS guidelines also recommends this. Again, we recommend maximum two attempts at supraglottic airway device. One difference from the DAS guidelines is we have recommended that at every between each attempt, saturation should be fine. And again, like the tracheal tube, you must do something in each subsequent attempt to increase success. For example, I tried one type of LMA, it didn't go in, I should try another type, or I should change the operator, or I should change the position. And while doing all this, remember, maintain the depth of anesthesia. Now, if your supraglottic airway device is successfully put in and you can ventilate the patient, your oxygenation is preserved. So you have time. Sit back, relax. And this is the time when you should think, what should I do next? I could not intubate, but I put in a supraglottic airway device and now ventilation is successful. Remember, not intubating will not kill a patient. Not ventilating will. Not oxygenating will. So maintain oxygenation at all times. Even if you can't intubate, no problem. Put in the supraglottic airway device and maintain good oxygenation. Now, once you have a supraglottic airway device, don't be in a hurry to remove it. Some senior person comes and says, oh, remove it. I will do laryngoscopy and I will check. No, there are four options. You can either say, okay, this is a difficult airway. I don't want to do this today. You tell the surgeon, you just let the patient come out of anesthesia, wake up the patient. That is also a safe option. The second is you can continue anesthesia using a supraglottic airway device. For example, if it was a small breast surgery, you can just continue, finish the case, and then you can uh, reverse the patient. The third option is to intubate through the supraglottic airway device. Now, remember, this is very, very important. If you do this, you should do it only with someone who has expertise to intubate through the supraglottic airway device, and you should do it using a bronchoscopy. Never do blind intubation through the supraglottic airway device because there are chances that you could go into the esophagus and then you can lose the airway and reinserting the supraglottic airway device. Remember, there is failure 
for superglottic airway device uh, insertion, even three to six percent. So you have to be very, very careful. And then suppose you're in a very remote uh, location and you don't have uh, these kind of uh, bronchoscope and expertise, even doing a tracheostomy by the surgeon is a safe option. Remember, safety comes first, patient safety comes first. We don't want to give any hypoxic events. So these are all the options that are available once your suprotic airway device goes in. But of course, even the suprotic airway device insertion can fail, and then this becomes a suprotic airway uh, device uh, failure. And subsequently, what we do is that we have a last attempt at what we call rescue face mask ventilation, right? Now, in this uh, you know, uh, uh, step, you have to continue the oxygenation very important, ensure neuromuscular blockade. Now, some people might argue that, you know, I can't intubate this patient, I can't put superglottic airway device, and all guidelines are saying give neuromuscular blockade. So this is something very new. It's a paradigm shift in the way we are looking at airway management. Now, earlier we used to say, oh, if you can't ventilate, don't give neuromuscular blockade. Now we are saying, if you can't ventilate, give neuromuscular blockade. Because by giving the neuromuscular blockade, you're increasing the chances of successful ventilation. Also, look at it. You have failed intubation. Uh, this is your last attempt at mask ventilation. You're with your back against the wall. What option do you have? You have to proceed now to neck rescue. So you're, this is a procedure you have never done in your life or you're doing job you done just once or you're doing for the first time. The chance of success, both of ventilation and of the procedure being successful is if you're given muscle relaxant and therefore give the muscle relaxant. If you have used succinethonium, you may have to repeat. Otherwise, uh, if you have not taken too long, you can continue with the, the muscle relaxant action may uh, be, but make sure the patient has adequate nasomuscular blockade. And then you attempt one final attempt at mask ventilation with the best technique, two hand using airway, uh, you know, the best technique that you can use. Now, if you are successful, then of course, don't try anything, just wake up this patient. But if you are not successful, then our Indian guidelines call it complete ventilation failure. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the DAS guidelines uh, calls, calls this uh, KAIKO, that is cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. We call it complete ventilation failure. And an additional thing that we have done is we have said call for additional help. Now, in the beginning, you call for help, but at this point, calling for additional help is very, very important, not only for one extra hand to help you, but also taking into account the human factor consideration in which I talked to you in the first slide. Because at this time, whoever is present in the hall, in the operating room or in the ICU, wherever the intubation is happening, is very nervous, is very stressed, is not able to think straight. So the additional hand that comes not only helps with the tracheal intubation, but can also think rationally and give you sometimes a very simple solution. Even sometimes a very junior person who comes in will say, oh, why don't you do that? Oh, why don't you do this? And they are right, you know, because you are stressed, so you are not uh, thinking straight. So this is extremely important. Now, what do we mean by complete ventilation failure in the Indian guidelines? It means it's a situation where all your three lifelines have failed. What are the three lifelines? Tracheal intubation, ventilation using supraglottic airway device, and mass ventilation. All have failed despite the best attempt. Now, what is important is we say that even if oxygenation is maintained, even if saturation is 100, still you must proceed to do cricothyrotomy. Now, when you say cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, you are waiting for oxygenation failure. Even when you say cannot oxygenate, people are confused what is the meaning of oxygenation, cannot oxygenate. Because when you give apneic oxygenation with the high flow nasal oxygen, as most of you know, you can prolong the safe apnea time or the saturation for many minutes. So are you going to wait till desaturation to do the cricothyrotomy? So what is important is that ventilation failure precedes oxygenation failure. When you cannot ventilate a patient, you know that the saturation is going to fall. Whether it will fall in two minutes or eight minutes depends on how the patient's reserve and how good your pre-oxygenation and apneic oxygenation has been. You cannot predict this, but what you can predict is that patient cannot be ventilated and the saturation will fall very soon. So isn't it better to do the neck rescue or the cricothyrotomy when you cannot ventilate? rather than when you cannot oxygenate. And that is why the Indian guidelines say, do cricothyrotomy when you have complete ventilation failure and not when you have oxygenation failure. So this is a new term that we have coined and both the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the PUMAT guidelines have now removed, cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, and they're using the term cannot ventilate in their guidelines because ventilation failure, as I mentioned, precedes oxygenation failure. And that should be your trigger to do a cricothyrotomy. So this is again the situation and then of course, emergency cricothyrotomy. Now, uh, the, again, remember the procedure in an emergency is 
is not tracheostomy, it is cricothyrotomy. Continue oxygenation. The DAS guidelines recommend surgical cricothyrotomy. And we recommend do whatever procedure you're familiar with, whether it's surgical cricothyrotomy or needle cricothyrotomy, or there are some special sets available, white bore, cannula, cricothyrotomy, Coke, Smith, different companies. They have ready-made sets which use Seldinger technique. You can use that or needle cricothyrotomy. But it's not about needle. It's very easy to put in. But remember, if you're putting a needle, you should have pressure regulated jet ventilation, right? And most importantly, the upper airway has to be patent. So just having needle is not enough. If you don't have jet ventilation, don't put in a needle. So the Indian guidelines recommend use whatever technique because we are saying that people are not familiar. So whatever technique you know, do it, but do something. Don't keep on and on intubating, putting in supraprotic airway, mass ventilation. You must proceed to doing a cricothyrotomy very early. And we like to use the word emergency cricothyrotomy because emergency gives you a sense that, you know, there is something wrong. Like when you say cardiac arrest, you know, it gives you a sense of emergency. And cricothyrotomy gives you the exact anatomical landmark that you will target. And that's why instead of saying phona, which is front of neck access, we use the term emergency uh, cricothyrotomy. Now, very important, whenever you have a stormy airway, unanticipated difficult airway, you must have a post-procedure plan. What is your further airway management plan? Sometimes you would have done cricothyrotomy, but you have to follow it up with a the tracheostomy. There could be a lot of airway edema. So remember, this airway can deteriorate subsequently. So you must examine the airway, monitor for complications. And most important is counseling the patient, if possible, and the family and documenting this is extremely important. People don't document and the patient goes for anesthesia or to some ICU and nobody knows this was an anticipated difficult airway. And then they have the same problem. So very important that you should counsel the patient and also document. So this is what the guidelines look like. Many unique features of these guidelines. Uh, we have stressed on peri-intubation oxygenation, which is very, very important. Oxygenation, pre-oxygenation. Uh, oxygenation, nasal oxygen during attempts and intubation. Uh, our guidelines stress on a threshold of more than 95% before proceeding between attempts. A new terminology, complete ventilation failure instead of KAIKO, that is cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. Calling for additional help considering human factor considerations and cricothyrotomy as a technique based on the familiarity of whatever equipment you have, do something and proceed to the uh, thing. So what's important is the human factor considerations during any unanticipated difficult airway. Now, what do you mean? What happens now in a crisis? And I'm sure you all have witnessed this at some time. It is very important, you know, very common to be presented with more information than you can uh, process. And this cognitive overload that happens impairs decision making and can cause the clinical to clinician to lose sight of the big picture. Right in front of him, he's seeing a supraglottic airway device, but he's not picking it up. You know, because there's so much cognitive overload, there's so much stress that you're not seeing what is in front of your eyes. You're again and again, again and again, putting the laryngoscope. You're not changing over to the video laryngoscope. You're not doing something different. And there is this fixation error that occurs. And you have task fixation. This is all very well documented in, uh, you know, human factor considerations. So human, and you know, in the national audit project that was done in the UK, when they looked at adverse events related to airway management, both in and outside uh, the operating room, they saw that human factors were, uh, you know, contributed to adverse outcomes in almost 40% of the cases. So we should not only think about technical skills, but non-technical skills and various human factor considerations should be made uh, when we talk about safety of airway management when we when we are encountered with an unanticipated difficult airway. And what are the latent threats to these uh, condition? Poor communication, poor training. Now we are only trained how to get the tube in, how to get the tube in. We are not trained for, you know, if you fail, how to do proper teamwork, how to communicate with the tube, uh, you know, then there could be deficiencies in equipment and inadequate systems and processes. So all these are latent threats for having, uh, you know, various complications, which where the human factors come into consideration. So I'll just leave you with the uh, guidelines and, um, you know, the special features. And what's very important is critical language is very important. Now, this is a very nice editorial by uh, Tim Cook and Nicholas Crimes. They call it critical airways, critical language. Now, what is critical language? Now, critical language is the language that you use during an emergency, okay? Now, this is very important. You have a cardiac arrest, you say, cardiac arrest. So everybody understands this is an emergency. So critical language must be very specific. It must be very clear. It must be universally understood. There should be no abbreviations. So the same thing like for CPR and cardiac arrest, we should have for airway management. We wrote an editorial that critical language during an emergency, airway, airway uh, emergency, is it time to rethink the terminology? So if you look at the terminology, 
that is used in the difficult airway society DAS guidelines is CAICO and FONA. These are abbreviations, cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, and FONA is front of neck access. Now, this is very dominant in the literature, but if you look at what is dominant in clinical practice, it is emergency cricotherotomy. We've termed the uh, we've used the term complete ventilation failure. I explained why complete ventilation failure is a more appropriate term because ventilation failure precedes oxygenation failure. So we should not wait for oxygenation failure. In addition to this, cannot intubate. Intubation is not the only way today uh, to um, oxygenate a patient, patient, right? You have supraglottic airway device, you have mass ventilation. We don't intubate all the patients we give anesthesia to. So cannot intubate becomes a little redundant. And like I told you, cannot oxygenate, especially in the era of apneic oxygenation, where you can prolong the safe apnea time for a large amount of time, can be a little dangerous. So we should use ventilation for the trigger rather than oxygenation. Regarding front of neck, okay, so front of neck access, again, phona, kaikophona may not be universally understood. When you say emergency cryotherapy, it is very, very specific. You're saying emergency. So everybody understands there is a problem. And cryotherapy because you're giving a specific uh, landmark to this uh, patient, right? So when you, uh, these are the issues with Kaiko and uh, Fona. And you can see that uh, what I've told you about complete ventilation failure and the problem with front of neck access. Now, does Fona does not con convey a sense of emergency, urgency as when we say emergency cryotherapy, right? Then, so they changed it from Fona to E-Fona. E-Fona means emergency phona. But what does e phona stands for? e phona stands for electronic, like email, e-cigarette, right? Then why front? We never say front of face ventilation, right? So why do you need the word front? The word front for uh, neck access is not uh, required. Unless you are thinking of some, I don't know which back of neck procedure you are thinking of, unless you are thinking of maybe cervical epidural or something, right? So front is not required. And then when you say neck access, which access are you talking about? Are you talking about the IJV? Are you talking jugular vein? Are you talking about cricotherotomy? Are you talking about tracheostomy? So this is not specific. When you say emergency cricotherotomy, there's a sense of emergency and you are talking about the specific anatomical landmark that is a cricotherot membrane recommended when you have <clears throat> a complete ventilation failure. So there's a lot of discussion happening in the terminology and both the Puma guidelines and the ASA guidelines have not used oxygenation and have not used the term phona and they have moved away from this to talking about cricotherotomy. Now very very important once you have secured the airway that you should have continuous waveform capnography and I'm very proud to say that the Indian guideline is the first guideline that have talked about six consistent waveforms with no decline. Now this no decline is very important because if your tube is in the esophagus like I said if air is in your stomach you can have a decline in the end tidal CO2 and that tube may not be in the trachea so be very careful never react to one trace of a capnography Wait until you see six to seven creases and the recent Puma guidelines on unrecognized esophageal intubation. And this was a consensus guideline from the Puma uh, group, which is working on universal airway guidelines. Uh, what the Puma group is about, I'm a member of this group. And I can tell you that they are saying that, okay, in India, you have Indian guidelines, you, US, you have United States guideline, uh, you know, DAS has separate guidelines and there are many countries without guidelines. Are we going to wait for all countries to make guidelines? So why don't we have a universal guideline? Like you have AHA guidelines for CPR, we should have a universal guideline for airways. And this guideline will be released next year. But this uh, this year, they released, the group released a guideline on preventing unrecognized esophageal intubation because there were two deaths in the UK and in Australia related to unrecognized esophageal uh, airway. And we emphasize the need for confirming tube placement using waveform capnography. And this has been just been published in Anesthesia. And I'm very proud to be a member of this uh, Puma uh, team, which is a project for universal management of the airway. And what have they talked about? They have talked about using this. When you see capnography, you should have consistent waveform. You can have increasing amplitude, but you should never have decreasing amplitude in the capnography. So this is the kind of trace that you're looking at, normal trace. And uh, the amplitude should be, depending upon what unit you're using, kilopascals or you're using millimeters of mercury, we use this. So at least 7.5 above baseline and the reading should be clinically appropriate. And because, you know, many times there was bronchospasm or there was cardiac arrest and people said, oh, there's no capnography, so it's okay. But actually the tube was in the esophagus. So you have to, this kind of criteria where there is a trace and it's declined or it's not present 
inadequate amplitude is not acceptable. So be very careful. Don't respond to one trace. Make sure you have six to seven traces over six to seven breaths, and there should be consistent waveform capnography. And use capnography and not just auscultation and chest rise to confirm uh, the tube uh, position, right? So uh, there will be an update from 2016 for the uh, Indian guidelines. We're planning to release this very, very shortly. I'll also now talk about the most recently uh, released guidelines, that is the ASA guidelines. And ASA comes up with the guidelines every uh, 10 years. So they had one in 93, 2003, and they have just published in 2022. And I'm really, really proud to say that I was the first non-American to be on this guideline committee. And it was really, really a proud moment uh, to be on a team uh, along with uh, American Americans giving a non-American perspective to these uh, guidelines. So the American Society of Anesthesiologists guidelines, uh, this was a team, a 14 member team. Uh, as you can see, most of them are, uh, you know, Americans. And uh, this was uh, me over here from India. So it was really, really a proud moment for me to be a part of drafting these guidelines. They have just been a release and they're out on the internet. So I must say one thing, when I was part of these guidelines, I was very, very impressed by the extremely robust process they have for the literature review. They have two methodologists on board, very, very nicely done. For example, even if the uh, committee member said, I want to include this, the methodologist would say, no, there is no literature to support this and you cannot include this statement. So they were there that strict. So I think among all the societies and all the guidelines, the ASA guidelines is very robust in terms of uh, the literature search. So they have come up with one adult algorithm, one pediatric algorithm and four infographics. Now I'm sure most of you have, uh, these are just some of the highlights. I'll come to each of these and the steps of making the guideline procedure, uh, process. They have excluded patients who don't they only deal with difficult airways and they have not uh, physiological but anatomically difficult airway they have not taken and airway management during CPR all this has been excluded in the uh, ASA guidelines and like I said very very robust literature search uh, you know done by two methodologists now I'm sure all of you must have seen this because this was uh, pretty much what the old ASA guidelines look like I can tell you very honestly I was quite disappointed when I was working in this on um, this algorithm because we made very nice infographics but finally the ASA wanted to retain the original algorithm. So they've just made very subtle changes. If you see uh, limiting the attempts, they still don't give the exact number of attempts that we should have. And, uh, you know, um, they have talked about, uh, you know, considering, uh, uh, you know, time awareness and they're limiting the attempts. Otherwise, everyone think pretty much is the same. Uh, like I told you, there is no kaikophona. They talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ventilation failure and Instead of uh, emergency cricotherotomy, they say emergency invasive airway, but they have not used the word front of neck access. So this is, uh, I find this a little complicated because it's a very branch tree appearance, you know, arrows going in left, right direction. But what is very nice is that uh, they have made a decision making tree. And I'd like to focus on this because this is the most important part, I think, of the guidelines that people are not looking at. Not very impressive, the initial algorithm. Now I'll come to the decision-making tree. And the decision-making tree is excellent because it's the first time that, you know, uh, an airway society has put out these kind of recommendations. Now, this is very important. Now, why do you have an unanticipated difficult airway? Because you give general anesthesia to the patient. You give muscle relaxing to the patient. And then you cannot ventilate them. You cannot intubate them. And then you're in a situation where you have complete ventilation failure and you have to do cricotherotomy, et cetera. Now, why don't we prevent this situation when nobody is talking about preventing this situation? So this decision-making tree helps you decide whether to do an awake intubation or whether to do an asleep intubation. So, you know, nobody has ever thought about this. If you give clinician guidance that don't give general anesthesia to this patient, sometimes we are in a soup because we have given general anesthesia. We have given muscle relaxing to the patient. So whenever you have a suspected difficult laryngoscopy or intubation with a direct video laryngoscope, okay, so if you suspect it, yes, then you have to ask yourself these three questions. One is, is the mask ventilation, is ventilation going to be difficult? Am I going to be able to ventilate with a supraglottic airway device or a face mask easily? Uh, then the second question, is there an aspiration risk? And the third question is, is this patient, you know, has he got a physiologically difficult airway, low reserves, and there'll be rapid desaturation? Okay, so these are the three questions that you should ask yourself. If if your answer is yes to these questions, straight away do awake airway management. Don't even think of doing, uh, you know, a sleep airway management. But if your answer is no, it's not a difficult mass. So intubation may be difficult, but mass ventilation is easy. 
and there's no risk of aspiration and the patient is not likely to rapidly desaturate or poor respiratory reserve, then you can consider doing an awake intubation. So these are the questions every operator must ask before anesthetizing a patient and assessing the airway. And you know the beauty of this, this can be this algorithm pathway may be different for you, may be different for me, may be different for an airway expert because it really depends on what are the tools available in your uh, armamentarium and what is the expertise available uh, from your team, right? And also they give a very nice algorithm for awake airway management, which is really beautiful. No one talks about how to deal with awake airway management because everyone says, okay, you have an unanticipated difficult airway, then do awake airway management. But what if awake airway management also fails? No one tells you, there's no guideline for this. So for the first time they have given an infographic about this. And I'll just put you through this. This is what the algorithm looks like. So they have said, firstly, deliver, when you're doing awake intubation, deliver oxygen throughout. This is very important, okay? So whether you're doing any awake technique or you're doing elective invasive airway, that is a tracheostomy, give oxygen to this patient during the procedure. So even when you're doing fiber optic, you can give nasal oxygen. Even when you are, uh, you know, giving, you can apply this face mask. If an ICU patient is there, there are special masks through which you can put the fiber scope and you can continue to give CPAP. So apply oxygen early and continuously throughout the procedure. This is very important and the guidelines have emphasized on that. And what is very important, is every patient doesn't have to have a tube in. When you talk about awake intubation, you should consider tracheostomy. For example, look at this Lefant's fracture. Okay, so this is a, uh, you know, both there's trauma over here, both nasal bleeding, oral bleeding, both bronchoscopy as well as video laryngoscopy is the, you know, blood and secretions are the enemy for these devices. And it'll be very, very difficult to intubate this patient. So such patients require an upfront neck procedure, whether it's surgical trichotherapy, needle, tracheostomy, whatever you want to do. So sometimes you have to do an awake tracheostomy under local. Or you can do one of the awake techniques in other situations. You can have awake direct laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy, awake intubation with a flexible scope, awake suprapnotic dis dis uh, device insertion, or you can even have a combination of the techniques. You can, you can do awake flexible scopy and you can guide that using a video laryngoscopy. So whatever is the technique that you can use, but what is very important is confirm the success, as I told you, always, even during a new awake intubation, using waveform capnography. And no one tells you what to do if you fail to intubate. Remember, even awake intubation can fail. Now, if you fail, then there are different options. Firstly, always call for help. I told you any difficulty you have, always call for help. Sometimes you're doing awake bronchoscopy, that might fail. Awake VL might fail. So what do you do when you fail to establish your primary technique that you're using that fails? So you can use what we call the non-emergency pathway. So first thing you can do is, I'm not able to intubate this patient. Patient is awake. I just postpone the case. Okay. Or you can do one of the other two things. You know, uh, away, uh, you can use another awake technique. For example, I use bronchoscopy. That's not working. I can do awake VL. Or I can just do a straightaway tracheostomy for this patient if my awake technique is not working. Or I can use an alternate anesthetic technique. I can use some regional blocks. Or I can use some other anesthesia, not necessary that I have to put a tube. Very, very important to remember that even while doing an awake procedure, patient can become unstable, patient can obstruct. And this you cannot postpone such a case. Patient is desaturating, you know, there's obstruction. And you may need to urgently induce anesthesia. This patient is hypoxic, thrashing around. So you may need to induce anesthesia. And at this time, you should have complete preparation for emergency invasive airway access, not elective emergency. So this is very, very important to remember what are your options when there is failure. And I will talk to you about emergency uh, airway access and the infographic that the ASA has given. So these infographics, whether it is on decision making or the pathway for awake intubation, and now this is the pathway for awake intubation, the summary of this are very, very beautiful and innovative uh, with the American Society of Anesthesiologists have given. And I'll very put, quickly put you through this. And this is the infographic that we made, which I was hoping ASA would make their main algorithm but they just left it as an infographic, but it's really beautiful. And I'm sure all of you will appreciate this. So if you have a patient which you're anesthetizing, review the airway management strategy, pre oxygenate and induce anesthesia, of course. And then there are two situations. One is your airway plan is successful. Then you continuous plan, confirm tube placement with uh, capnography. If it is not successful, whatever your plan, whether putting a tube or suprapnotic airway device, then there's only one question you have to ask yourself, can I ventilate this patient? Okay, if you can ventilate, you're in the non-emergency pathway. If you cannot ventilate, you're in the uh, you know, emergency pathway. 
So let us talk about the non-emergency pathway. So I can, cannot intubate the patient, but I can ventilate with the mask, okay? So in the non-emergency pathway, okay, you can use an alternate device. You can proceed to invasive airway access, or you can even wake up the patient. So they say you interchange between one step or the other. Keep on trying to do whatever you can to secure the device. Maximum three attempts, but very important. Don't go on and on and on putting the device and also be aware of the time that has lapsed. Now, in this situation, if your ventilation remains adequate and you know, you're able to secure the device, then that's fine. Just use capnography and confirm. But if your ventilation is inadequate, becomes inadequate, uh, it's not adequate, then you go to the emergency pathway. Okay, now what is the emergency pathway? Now, emergency pathway is a situation where you cannot ventilate the patient. So your primary airway is not gone in and you also cannot ventilate it. Now, this is a dangerous situation. So here you have three lifelines, as I told you, face mask, subclotic airway device, and tracheal tube. You must interchange one to the other. Try face mask, doesn't work, put in subclotic or put in tube. So maximum three attempts at each of these. And remember, always stay aware of the time and what is the saturation, right? Now, if despite your best attempt, you're not able to do this, then and your ventilation remains inadequate, of course, go to emergency invasive airway or the cryotherapy, rigid bronchoscopy, ECMO, whatever. Now, if you succeed in this, of course, you go into the non-emergency pathway where you can ventilate. So I think this is really a beautiful infographic that you know summarizes very nicely what you should do during an unanticipated difficult area. Unfortunately, people are only seeing the algorithm that is given by ASA, but I urge you to look at the uh, infographic. And as I mentioned to you now, after the ASA, and I'll just be ending in another two minutes, uh, you know, there we have the project for universal management of the airways. And this uh, was, uh, you know, presented at the World Airway Management Meeting in 2019 in Amsterdam. And I'm very, very proud to be a member of this group. And we are working towards making universal airway management uh, guidelines, you know. So the these are not exactly guidelines, but they are more about, uh, you know, the principles of airway management, universal principles, and hopefully uh, in 2023, these guidelines will be uh, released. And this has members from different airway societies across the globe, and we will take the best aspects of all airway society guidelines uh, so that we can have the best way to deal with the unanticipated uh, difficult airway. So as I mentioned, the ASA guidelines to me is a very robust guideline uh, because it's systematically driven, data driven. Uh, very good literature search and also uh, they've used uh, both uh, you know it can help both practitioners and patients and uh, very familiar methodology I don't know if I have time but uh, I will end here but I do have a few cases if you permit me uh, shall I go ahead or you can put uh, or is it too late Please continue, uh, yeah. I can continue Okay, maybe I can just show you one case. So uh, I would like to have answers in the chat and Rico and uh, Dr. Rico, if you can help me uh, with, because I cannot see the chat, I would like to have responses, okay? So uh, let me just put you through a case because I think whatever I say should be put into practice to give it a better understanding. So this is a lady, 40 year old patient scheduled for hysterectomy, undergoing general anesthesia. Airway is clinically unremarkable, okay? Now she undergoes a conventional intravenous anesthetic induction. So fentanyl has been given propofol after pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen. And there is initial difficulty in mass ventilation. And now the saturation starts to fall. It falls to 94%. So what should I do now? Should I increase the depth of anesthesia and insert a suprolotic airway device? Or should I give a muscle relaxant to this patient? Or should I perform some maneuvers to improve the mass ventilation? Or should I just put in a laryngoscopy and try to intubate this patient or something else? So if you can just put in the chat and uh, Dr. Rico, if you can help me or tell me what is the answers that people are putting in the chat. Please put your responses. Okay, you can just put, yeah, just tell me what majority are saying, yeah? So there is initial difficulty as you can see in mask ventilation, okay? That's what has happened. Saturation is dropping to 94. What would you like to do? Do we have some responses? There's. Uh, you can tell me what the majority are saying. Majority. Yeah. Uh, there's majority saying. Yeah. Three, doctor. Three. Okay. Perform very Number good. Three. Excellent. Excellent. 
So this is exactly, this is the initial difficulty. You don't know who is the operator. It may be just a junior resident. So initial desaturation, uh, maybe poor mass ventilation. So they did a two-handed, so that's the right answer. Uh, don't go straight away to try to intubate the patient. Maybe you can increase depth and give muscle relaxant, but try to perform maneuvers to improve mass ventilation. So two-handed technique with oropharyngeal airway in place overcame the initial difficulty in maintaining the uh, airway and saturation came up to 97%. But then what happened is following the muscle relaxant paralysis, there was increased difficulty in mass ventilation. And now the saturation drops to 90%. So quite surprising, muscle relaxant was given and now the saturation falls. Now what I should do? Do laryngoscopy and try to intubate this patient or in, uh, insert a supraglottic airway device and try to ventilate the patient. Or if I have a video laryngoscope, I use it and try to intubate the patient or something else. So put your answers in the chat very quickly. What would you like to do in this situation? Saturation is falling. Oh, sorry. Yeah? Major? 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 One or three. One or three, yeah. So... Yes, okay, perform laryngoscopy and uh, yeah, try to, uh, okay. So one and three, so perform laryngoscopy and try to intubate, yeah, okay, reasonable. Or if I have a video laryngoscope, I will uh, use it, okay. So what they try to do is they try to, uh, you know, put uh, awaken one, just one minute, I'll just try to close this window. Yeah, so this was the situation, okay, and uh, you know, what was done was a pro seal LMA was uh, put in in this situation because see the the situation is different in this setting because uh, as you see the saturation is now you know ninety dropping to ninety okay so what this is what you see on the pulse oximeter so what's actually even lower so it's a dangerous kind of situation so you know the best is to put in a supraglottic airway device and try to uh, oxygenate this patient because now the situation is not the same as when the saturation was uh, ninety four. So what they did is they put a ProSeal LMA inside and adequate ventilation was maintained. Saturation came up to 99%. So now what are the options? You want to wake up this patient, postpone the case, or continue the case using a suprocotic airway device, or you want to remove the suprocotic airway device and intubate the patient, or you want to intubate through the suprocotic airway device using the available techniques, or you want to do something else. So what would you prefer to do? So this is a laparoscopic hysterectomy, huh? just remember. Your LMA is inside and patient's oxygenation has come up. Saturation is now 99. So uh, what would you like to do? Perhaps I would like to uh, number one, Prof. Is it all right? Yeah. <laughs> but then the surgeon is never going to call you again, yeah? Oh, yes. If you're, <laughs> if you're going to postpone this case, yeah? So it's a, a hysterectomy. So what would you like to do? Laparoscopic? So I would say if some people can, you know, they do laparoscopic surgery, even using a subclotic airway device, they can continue. Or you try to intubate through the subclotic airway device. But remember, you need a bronchoscope and a tube. But removing the LMA is a dangerous option and trying to intubate. So this is something that we should not be doing. Uh, I can maybe show you another case. Okay, one, one more case. Is there time for one more case? Or should I stop? It's, uh, it's okay. We still yeah. have time, Professor, for another <laughs> okay. case. Yeah. So this is now a 23-year-old lady uh, at term. She presents with fetal movements, decreased fetal movements. Typical, you know, she's had full dinner before coming to hospital. An obstetrician says cord prolapse and we need emergency cesarean section. So no time for spinal. Anesthesiologist performs the uh, examination. pre oxygenation is done, induces anesthesia. And we are, of course, planning rapid sequence because she has had full meal. Laryngoscopy is performed. Thiopentone and scoline reveals an only epiglottis is been. In spite, now this time, all the laryngoscopy has been optimized and everything you can see, only the epiglottis. So now what would you like to do? Release the cricoid pressure during laryngoscopy to improve the view. Or you want to keep the cricoid pressure and use a video laryngoscope if it's available. Or do you want to do bronchoscopy? Or do you want to put in a pro seal or a supreme LMA or something else? 
saturation has fallen to 92%. Please respond. I'll just take two, three more minutes, yeah? So what is your, your best option? Obstetric patient, she's had a full meal and she's come. Sorry? Uh, there's uh, answer. Sorry, I can't hear you, yeah? Hello? Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, there's an yeah. uh, answer from our attendees. There is number two, Professor. Two, yeah. Maintaining record pressure and yeah. So if you have a VL, definitely that can improve the view. So maintain that. You can do that. Fiber optic, not a good option because patient's already paralyzed. It'll take time to set it up. Patient will desaturate. Or you can even consider inserting a ProSeal or a Supreme Airway to auctionate the patient. What was done in this case? A ProSeal LMA was inserted and we saw that ventilation is successful. Okay, so saturation came up. And we continued LSCS with the ProSeal LMA. And we awakened the patient. Now, in this situation, if your ventilation is successful, okay, this lady has had a full meal. Remember, there are two lives here, the mother and the baby. So if you put the ProSeal in, saturation has come up. Do you want to continue cesarean with ProSeal? Or you want to just wake up the patient? Or you want to attempt to intubate through the ProSeal? Or something else? I'm very interested in your answer. What you like to do? So you're not able to intubate many attempts. You just put in ProSeal and now you can ventilate very easily. Dr. Rico? Num number two, maybe. Oh. Number two. Okay, but this is a kind of emergency LSCS as called yeah. prolapse, right? So uh, waking up may not really be the option because a little bit of emergency surgery. Uh, there's uh, perhaps number three, Professor, we have. Yeah, so if you have, you could do that, but otherwise it really is reasonable to continue with the ProSeal because sometimes trying to do all this, you might create a little messy situation in emergency. So till the baby is delivered, you can very, you know, because uh, it depends how fast your obstetrician is. So you can continue with the ProSeal LMA. They quickly deliver the baby and then you can consider to put the tube in if required, or if you have a very fast surgeon who's going to close very fast, you need not even do that. So this is something that you have to outweigh the risk and the benefit because there are two lives at stake. So probably till the baby is delivered, you can continue with the ProSeal and subsequently you can either put in a tube, but remember, do it with a bronchoscope and with someone who knows how to intubate through the ProSeal. And then the last one, this is a 50 year old female with for radical mastectomy with reconstruction, uh, unremarkable airway, Propofol, fentanyl, easy mask ventilation. But when they did laryngoscopy, it was Cormac Lihane 4. And they did everything, optimized laryngoscopy, external laryngeal manipulation. And even after doing best, uh, you know, positioning and uh, pressure and everything, only posterior glottic aperture was visible. Now, a bougie was attempted. Intubation over the bougie was also unsuccessful, okay? Now, in this, and the saturation is now dropping to 86 so what should you do next? Put in a supraglottic airway device. Uh, saturation is 86, okay? Continue mask ventilation and use a video laryngoscope or continue bag mask ventilation and do bronchoscopy or something else. So as I mentioned, the surgery was a radical mastectomy and mask ventilation was easy. Only intubation was difficult. Dr. Rico? Uh, number one. Number one, okay. So I think, yeah, number one is a great uh, option. Uh, it's also reasonable to do, uh, mass ventilation was easy, right? So you can, if you have video line, you can bring up the saturation and you can try video laryngoscopy. Definitely not bronchoscopy because this is going to take time in a paralyzed patient, but you can one or two, I would say is acceptable alternative. One is a good idea. And that is what they did. They put the supraglottic airway device, but there was bleeding in the pharynx. And once the bleeding started, there was inability to ventilate and face mask ventilation was also not possible. Saturation become 80%. Okay, so remember, even sometimes the supraglottic airway device can fail. So what would you do next? Quickly attempt video laryngoscopy or quickly with the Macintosh blade, try one more attempt or quickly do fiber optic intubation or one more quick attempt at supraglottic airway insertion or something else. Remember, you have already tried the SGA two times. 
saturation is 80. What would be the option? There's bleeding in well, the airway. Sorry? Um, perhaps we can use a number one, Professor? But you know, when there is bleeding, video laryngoscopy yeah. is not oh, a yes. very good. You will not see anything, you know? And okay, because of the yes, trauma yeah. of the bougie and trauma of the LMA, there's bleeding now. And you're not able to ventilate with the mask. You're not able to ventilate with suprarotic airway device. You are not able to intubate this patient. Any, any, any other option? There's an answer again from our attendees, Professor, that yes. is suction and try to intubate. That is from Dr. Rizky Bagus, Professor. Right. So if you're able to succeed with the suction, and but already three attempts at intubation, already superglottic airway device has been tried, and now saturation is 80. Perhaps it is the last attempt. We try to number three, Professor. <laughs> okay. So here, this is complete ventilation failure. Okay. And the saturation is 80. You are progressing into a very dangerous situation. And I would say the option should be other. And what is that other option? Anybody? Uh, that is cricothyroidectomy, Professor. Absolutely. Yeah. So the tell me which should be the best rescue strategy in this situation. Surgical tracheostomy, percutaneous, needle, surgical cricothyroidectomy, or something else. What is the answer? Response? Number, yeah. number three, Professor? Yeah, needle or four. So what's important is remember surgical and percutaneous are not, percutaneous is an elective procedure. Surgical tracheostomy is emergency, but not to be done in this setting. It can be needle or surgical cricothyrotomy, but remember you have to do emergency cricothyrotomy. So the important message from this is that when you reach the stage, when you've done multiple attempts at intubation, multiple attempts at suprarotic airway device, and you are not able to mask ventilate now, then, and the saturation is falling, do not waste time at doing any of this. Go straight to the neck rescue and that should be the cricothyrotomy, whatever is your technique, but that should be your other choice. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I'll just end by putting this slide that, you know, we are very strong, especially in Asian countries. Our plan A is really, really strong because we have a lot of patients. We have a lot of experience in tracheal intubation. But if you see, if our plan A fails, we are, there's you know, the thought that if you can't intubate, put in a suprarotic airway device, that does not come very fast. We are not trained that way. And if we put on this, you know, to maintain the oxygenation, and if that fails, uh, mask ventilation, and also the rescue uh, neck access, emergency cricothyrotomy, we are weaker and weaker and weaker in this because we don't think like this. We are only uh, thinking, can, if I intubate, let me try to intubate, let me try to intubate, let me try to intubate. But so we, while we should maintain a very strong plan A, we should try to set, strengthen the plan B, C, and D as well. Very few people are trained in doing the uh, neck rescue. So what happens is that if you fail in this, very less chances, but still you can have some morbidity and mortality. Patient, people don't know how to do the rescue techniques. On the other hand, if you have a situation where you have not so strong a plan A, but if you fail, you know that you need to put in a subclotic airway device. And if you fail that, you know that you must do last best attempt at mass ventilation. And if you fail that, you know how to do uh, rescue ventilation and emergency cricothyrotomy, then you will not have a situation where you have morbidity and mortality. So whatever the airway guidelines tries to emphasize that you should have strong plan A, not necessarily perfect, but your plan B, C, and D has to be perfect. And whatever the guidelines, whether it's IDA guidelines, DAS guidelines, American guide, ASA guidelines, all say first tube, if you fail, superglottic, if you fail, best attempt at mass ventilation. If all your three lifelines fail, despite the best attempt, neck rescue, whatever is the terminology that they use immediately go on to an emergency uh, cricothyrotomy. And that is the direction in which we should move. So I conclude by saying that your bedside screening tests to predict difficulty are not always reliable. 
among the tests are upper lip right layer. So be upper lip bite test. Be prepared always to face an unanticipated difficulty away using whatever I have mentioned to you now. Use of guidelines may help to manage an unanticipated difficulty away, but they're not the law. Use whatever suits you, but use a structured approach towards an unanticipated difficulty away. And adoptions of guidelines alone are not enough to avoid serious complications. And remember, don't focus only on the technical skills, focus on the human factors. Uh, with training in both technical and non-technical skills. So on behalf of the uh, All Near Difficult Airway Association, which I represent, the ASA, the Puma Guidelines, I wish to thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. That was such an interactive and an interesting presentation, Professor. Uh, perhaps you. we can continue to the discussion session. And perhaps to our attendees, if you have any question that you will uh, you would like to ask to Professor Sila, you can write it at the question and answer section. Yeah, we have exceeded the time. I hope that's okay. <laughs> we have exceeded. It's the okay, time. Professor. Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Perhaps I will ask a question. Yeah. Is it okay, Professor? Yeah, yeah. Please, please, please. Yes. yes. Okay, Professor, considering the, the recent pandemic that happens worldwide, is there any specific uh, step that we can try to minimize the risk of inspection, despite that the physician has already used a uh, full equipment, perhaps uh, a modification or something from the technique you mentioned earlier that can minimize the risk to spread the infection? Thank you, Professor. Right. So this is a very, very important point. And I think there are a lot of lessons that we have learned from COVID. Right. Uh, so for the first time during airway management, we were thinking not only about the risk to the patient, but also the risk to the operator. Until now, we were always worried the patient is going to desaturate. Uh, you know, there'll be complications to the patient. But we are also thinking about safety of patient along with safety of the operator. So this was a big change in the airway management. So one of the important things was the universal use of video laryngoscopy. And that was not so much because, you know, you have to minimize that time. So, and you have to minimize the number of personnel. So you cannot have the luxury of having, if you want to reduce the chance of transmission. So you may have only one or two people in the room, right? And in addition to this, uh, you cannot have your face going very close to the oral cavity. So video laryngoscopy gives you two benefits. One is it increases the chance of first pass intubation success. So your time to intubation is also, you know, you have shorter time rather than do first attempt, second attempt, third attempt. So less time with the airway. And secondly, you are looking at the screen, not like with direct laryngoscopy where you are going very close. So uh, definitely many, many institutes bought video laryngoscopy, many governments sanctioned video laryngoscopy. We got many more video laryngoscopes because of uh, COVID. So that was the silver lining. Uh, then, of course, you have to limit. Then the most important thing is the human factor consideration and the teamwork and communication. Because I am sure all of you wore personal protective equipment. You know how difficult it is to communicate. When you are trying to even look at the airway, there is fogging. And the person who is intubating is so scared. So there is a lot of you know anxiety. Will I get infected? Will I get infected? So people who are expert intubators, we were seeing that they were just not able to intubate. They were leaving the tube. They were getting nervous. So that is why the team briefing, the communication, even sign languages we were using that, you know, if this happens, you know, and keeping everything ready. So these are the really the lessons and limit the aerosol. See, initially we were not using high flow. We were not using bad mass ventilation. We were not doing many things uh, because we were worried about aerosol generation. But over time, we realized that this, the risk of aerosol is not so high as as we thought you can use high flow you can use gentle mass ventilation so the real the real uh, lesson at the end was do your usual airway management practices whatever is safe for the patient but protect yourself properly you know don't do something unfamiliar we were using intubation boxes and every design you know especially in the asian world so many different different boxes came and we were using uh, you know it became make airway management so difficult try to intubate through the intubation box. PPE was staring. We were trying to do something very unfamiliar. In fact, the discussion on this became so viral. It became more viral than the virus itself. You know how much discussion on Twitter and the social media, which intubation box, what type, what design. So these, you know, the lessons we learned finally were do what you are used to doing, do what you are comfortable with, do what you are always doing for patient safety, 
but protect yourself appropriately, minimize the time spent and minimize the number of operators. So that is the way I would say that are the real lessons learned for COVID that we should practice in future. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. So it is not enough to consider the patient safety. We have to, we have to consider our safety first before we can help the others, Professor. That is. Otherwise, you'll have no doctors left to look after the other patients. Yes. All of them. <laughs> yes. Yes, Professor. All right, for our attendees, if you have okay, any questions. other question, you can ask directly to Professor Sila, or you can chat via the Q&A column. Okay, Professor, uh, there is a question for our attendees that is from Dr. Rizky. Dr. Rizky Bagus, do you like to ask directly to Prof. Sila or you like to me to read it for Prof. Sila? Uh, maybe I just read it sure. for you too. Uh, so the question is, Prof, I want to ask a question. I am recently working in the ER as general physician. I have reason. I have a recent experience to intubate patient in the ER and fail once. The saturation happens, so I try to ventilate the patient with the mask, and the saturation are raising. In the second time, I do the intubation, and I was success doing the intubation. My question is: Are it okay to do that? Uh, we know that's in the guideline that you explain. We don't do the same thing repeat twice. But I know in my ER we don't have supraglottic airway device. So is it okay to do the same thing twice, Professor? Right. No, so it's, it's absolutely fine to do the same thing again, provided you think your first attempt was not your best attempt. I'm just saying that the next attempt, you know, try to, you should try to do something better than the first, because, you know, if you repeat the same thing again and again and again, I'm using direct laryngoscopy, I'm using the same position, I'm using the same tools. And, uh, you know, so the chance that you will be successful is less. But if you think in your first attempt, you didn't do it properly or you didn't attempt properly, you didn't visualize properly, it's okay. But I'm just saying that when you have three attempts, use something, think differently. Okay, I'm not so experienced. I have an experienced colleague. So maybe second attempt should be with that colleague. Okay, I use direct laryngoscopy. Why don't I change to video laryngoscopy? Okay, I, I didn't give good position. Why don't I give better position? So, you know, you have to have the thinking that, uh, you know, if you do something, if you're doing the same thing, the chance of the success is less, is, is less, isn't it? So try to do something better to increase the success. That's all I'm saying. But of course, nothing wrong in doing the same thing. It's just that you were lucky that you went in the next time. Maybe you did it better. You did a better laryngoscopic view. Yeah, and uh, it, what I really like is that you did mask ventilation. This is very important because just because all guidelines say three attempts, but three attempts doesn't mean do one, then do the other, then do the other. It means bring the saturation between attempts and no guideline talks about, and that is why in the Indian guidelines, we emphasize that bring the saturation up and then do the next attempt. So that is very important that, you know, like I said, not intubating will not kill the patient, not oxygenating will. So keep the patient well oxygenated by whatever lifeline you have, but oxygenation is paramount. So that's, I'm very happy that you did that between your two attempts. Thank you, but Professor. Next time, next time yes. I would say if you are not successful, then in that third attempt that you do, maybe you know try to use a video laryngoscope or if there is some more experienced person, call that person. Or if you get video laryngoscope, use that. Or if you fail, then put it in supraglottic. So change your plan. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you for your answer, Professor. That it, so it is okay to do the same uh, to do the same thing twice, but you have to modify it to if there's uh, something then to improve the technique. Okay, uh, we can accept one last question if there's any from our attendees, considering the. Hey, I'm Cindy. Uh, I'm one of the residents of uh, 
study program of anesthesiology and intensive care. Uh, maybe the things I would like to ask is about, uh, as we know, uh, maybe one of our our city in Indonesia is a resource limited uh, city. So maybe our our device to get to clear the airway is limited. So what can we do? Is it okay if we do a cricothyroidotomy or maybe we started from cricothyroidotomy or we should still start it from intubation? Thank you, Prof. Yeah, so um, even in resource limited settings, what is paramount is patient safety. We should not compromise on patient safety. Never mind if you don't have a video laryngoscopy. Like you saw when you put in a suprachiasmatic airway device, there are many options. Even tracheostomy is one option. Uh, you know, if you don't have bronchus, you can continue the case with that. Uh, so I would say when you talk about cricothyrotomy, you may not have jet ventilation, suppose. And this is not the situation in Indonesia. This is very much a situation in India also. And across the country, in the metros, we have every infrastructure. In smaller places, we don't have everything. So I'm just uh, trying to tell you that for cricothyrotomy, you can do surgical cricothyrotomy. All you need is scalpel, bugie, and tube. So this is available in any part of Indonesia. You will have a scalpel, you will have a bougie, and you will have a six-number endotracheal tube. So surgical cricothyrotomy can be taught to every person without any of the advanced sets or without jet ventilation can be easily done. In fact, the DAS guidelines recommends only surgical cricothyrotomy. But the important thing is about the teaching and training. So when you cannot intubate a patient, when you cannot ventilate, and you cannot mask ventilate or put in suprachiasmatic airway device, the problem is not the availability. The problem is people are not thinking that now I need to do cricothyrotomy. I should not go on and on and on doing laryngoscopy. So the problem really is not in the resource limited because when I talk to many people, people in India tell, oh, we don't have this, we don't have video laryngoscopy. It's about changing your mindset and also attempting to get the things available. We spend a lot of money on an expensive holiday, but we never think let's buy a video laryngoscope for the department, you know? So uh, cost is a little relative, I would say. So uh, this is why, uh, for all airways, I mean, whatever stage of airway management where you fail, there are very safe options. So I always tell people, do surgical cricothyrotomy if you fail. Everyone has endotracheal tube, everyone has scalpel blade, and everyone has, uh, you know, a bougie can be easily used. It's reusable. So. Okay, thank you again, Professor. I think that's uh, we have to complete our discussion Excuse session. Me. Right. I have one more question. Can I ask some? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm happy to answer. You have to see the time. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, I would like to ask you, what will, what will, what would should we do if we fail at the first, the first try, and then, during uh, spasm them happen? What, what is the, our next step, Professor? Right. This is a very important question. Again, you have to think that why did you fail? Now, especially when you have laryngospasm, mass ventilation will not work. So you have to give the relaxant. This is very important because if there's laryngospasm, even if you're doing your best mass ventilation, you won't be able to, you won't be able to ventilate the patient. So at this point, you know, and that can happen in lighter planes of anesthesia or some secretions trickling down and patient goes into laryngospasm. It used to happen a lot in the era when we used thiopentone, not so much with propofol. Increase the depth, give the muscle relaxant and ventilate. So of course you have to make modifications according to different situations. But if you want your mask ventilation to work and saturation to come up, you have to give the muscle relaxant. Thank you, Professor. Back to you, Dr. Akmal. Okay, okay, Dr. Rico. So uh, we, we have to, unfortunately, we have to conclude our discussion session. We are, uh, Thank you, Prof. Sila, for your splendid presentation and your nicely answered question from us. And thank you for all the attendees and all the audience for, for the question and the active. active. Uh, I, I yes, wish Professor? To, uh, yeah, I just wish to thank uh, Professor Lubis for giving me this opportunity. And of course, Dr. Akmal and Dr. Rico for helping me with the whole process, the interactive uh, discussion and the questions. And I wish to thank all the attendees for a very patient hearing. 
And I really hope I can come in person to Indonesia sometime and address all of you and meet all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. We, uh, we we gladly to waiting for your coming to Indonesia, <laughs> professor. Perhaps some. Uh, okay. Uh, okay uh, now. Perhaps we will have a take picture that will be lit by Dr. Rika Gandhi before we closing. Is it okay, Prof. Sila? Yes. We have a picture from Zoom. Okay, Dr. Rika Gandhi, please. Okay, before we close this session, I would like to invite all panelists and all the participants to open your camera because we would like to take documentation for today's lecture. Now from the panelist side, uh, we will take the picture. Please, the host. And now with the participant. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the gorgeous presentation and lecture. I hope you and your family are always in good health. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best and have a safe airway. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.